Hello, 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 and welcome to the Academy of Useless Ideas. Ah, uh, rational numbers, those well-behaved members of the number family, right? Wrong. As it turns out, when it comes to calculating limits, they've got some serious holes in their game. But fear not, we are not about to let these sneaky numbers to get the best of us. That's where dedicating cuts come in. No. Not a risky trim from your local barber, but a clever method to make sense of these pesky holes in the rational number line. And the best part? We won't even need sharp objects, just the ordered structure of the rational numbers will do. We start with an order set S, where the order is smaller or equal, and look at subsets of S. If a subset A of S has an upper bound U, such that U is greater than or equal to every element in A, then we say that A is upper bounded. We can define lower bounds and lower bounded sets in a similar way. But be warned, just because a set has upper and lower bounds doesn't mean that those bounds belong to the set. For example, consider the set of rational numbers between 0 and 1. This set is lower bounded by negative 1 and upper bounded by 2 but neither of these values belong to the set. In some cases, it is desirable to have bounds that belong to the set. We say that a set A has a minimum if there exists a lower bound in A that belongs to A. We define maximums in a similar way. The natural numbers have a minimum for every non-empty set and a maximum for every non-empty and upper bounded set. However, in a general order set, not every upper bounded set has a maximum. Consider, for instance, the set of rationals strictly smaller than 0. Indeed, for every x smaller than 0, the number x over 2 is larger than x but also smaller than 0. Lastly, we've got the minimum of a set of upper bounds of A, which we call the least upper bound or supremum of A and the maximum of the set of lower bounds of A is the greatest lower bound or infimum of A. Man, those terms are mouthful, but that's what we are dealing when it comes to math lingo, and to make things even more confusing, mathematicians like to shorten them to sup and inf. It's like they are trying to keep their little club exclusive or something. So how can we use these definitions to identify the holes in an ordered set? Well, let's take a look. A non-empty and upper bounded set C is called a Dedekind cut if it satisfies two conditions. Firstly, it's closed downwards, which means that if C prime is smaller than C and C is in capital C, then C prime is also in capital C. And secondly, capital C doesn't have a maximum. In the rational numbers, some cuts have a supremum and some do not. The cuts without a supremum are precisely the holes of Q. In other words, the existence of holes in the rational number line is closely related to the fact that not every non-empty and upper bounded set has a least upper bound. An ordered set is said to have the supremum property, or the least upper bound property, if every non-empty upper bounded set has a supremum. In other words, if we take any subset of an ordered set that has an upper bound, then it must have a least upper bound as well. The key difference between the rational numbers and the real numbers lies in their supremum properties. While the real numbers have the supremum property, the rational numbers do not. This is similar to how the integers have the property of having additive inverses, while the natural numbers do not have that property. In order to prove that the real numbers have the supremum property, we must construct them from the rationals. One approach to achieve this is by defining the real numbers as the Dedekind cuts of the rationals. However, this construction can be perplexing as it implies that each real number is a set containing infinitely many rational numbers. To illustrate, the real number 1 corresponds to the set of all rational numbers that are less than the rational number 1. Likewise, the real number square root 2 corresponds to the set of negative rational numbers in addition to all positive rational numbers whose square is less than 2. 
it's worth noting that we can identify each rational number q with the set of all rational numbers smaller than q. With this identification, we can view the rational numbers as a subset of the real numbers. Additionally, we can observe that the rational numbers are exactly the Dedekind cuts that have a supremum in the rational numbers. To establish a total order in the real numbers, we define that a real number x is less than or equal to another real number y if and only if x is a subset of y. With this definition, we now have the real numbers as an ordered field that extends the rationals. Importantly, we can also verify that every bounded set of real numbers has a supremum under this order. In fact, the supremum of a set of real numbers is simply the union of those numbers. The construction of the real numbers requires the definition of addition and multiplication. To define the addition of two real numbers a and b, we consider the sets corresponding to a and b and define the sum of a and b as the set of all elements alpha plus beta, where alpha is a member of the set corresponding to a and beta is a member of the set corresponding to b. Similarly, multiplication of a and b is defined as the set of all products of elements from their corresponding sets. To ensure that addition and multiplication satisfy the field axioms, we need to verify that there are closed under addition and multiplication, are associative, commutative, and have identity and inverse elements. Additionally, distributivity must hold between addition and multiplication. It's also essential to notice that the operations of addition and multiplication must extend those of the rational numbers. That is, if x and y are rational numbers, then the sum and product of x and y in the real numbers must coincide with the sum and product of x and y in the rational numbers. This is important because we want the real numbers to be a natural extension of the rational numbers. While constructing the real numbers may seem as daunting as climbing Mount Everest with a backpack full of rocks, taking the time to verify all the details is essential. But do not worry, the view from the summit is worth it. The result is a remarkable theorem. There exists an ordered field that extends the rational numbers and satisfies the least upper bound property. And believe it or not, from this seemingly dry and boring theorem springs forth the entire wondrous world of calculus. So strap on your boots, pack your bags, and let's get climbing.